uh, it doesn't necessarily matter why we want to remember them, but how do we remember certain events because we want to? So one example might be if I am trying to check up on facts that, I've, that, that I think I've heard somewhere about the COVID vaccine, I might want to just search in my memory to remember things that I've seen on reputable news websites rather than things that I've heard my friends talking about in the pub now that we can go to the pub again. So that's an example of trying to selectively um, recollect one kind of memory based on some kind of criterion, which is a little bit like the task that we're using. Um, I'll say also it's a little bit artificial, obviously. So in real life, your goals are set by you and you decide what you need to remember. And uh, what we're forced to do an experiment to try and understand this, as you'll see, is to sort of separate the goals in time from the items that trigger the specific memory. So we use this trick, we think, for good reasons. Um, and hopefully I'll succeed in explaining to you what we're trying to achieve. So the data I'm going to report are from two pre-registered ELP experiments that are now out in a preprint. Um, and some preliminary results from multivariate decoding analysis of one of these experiments, more to come soon. So what enables us to remember selectively? So it's well known that specific memories can be triggered by external cues. So, for example, if you experience something somewhere like on the Sussex University campus in spring, if you return to the campus or you see a photograph like this, it might bring back memories. And so this is a kind of time honored um, established way of um, triggering memories. But we also like to think that we're not entirely at the mercy of the external environment to trigger us to remember things. We believe that we can control to some degree what comes to mind. So how do we know that this is even possible? So a simple finding that tells us that this is possible is from back in the 70s when um, people were found. So if the external cue effect was that when people were asked to um, encode and later retrieve a list of words they did better when they retrieved in the same room that they encoded in simple result but if you put people in the same room and tell them to think of it in a different room and tell them to think about the original room then the external um, circumstance didn't make a difference anymore so it's quite a potentially powerful effect um, and it, it's referred to in lots of different terrible jargon but one phrase that i like is internal memory queuing and so this is uh, some data from Smith from 1979. Um, so um, questions that we can ask now. So we're going to start by asking about how the external memory cues and the internal goals can go together. And then we're going to look a little bit more about how the internal goals might um, operate, might make contact with the stored memory traces and um, also when it happens. And this is one of the reasons we're using retrieve uh, uh, EEG. So, does selection of memories reflect Q overlap with the study episode? So this is um, a long-standing theory called the encoding specificity principle that says that the more the Q overlaps with, which basically means is similar to the stored memory trace of the episode, in this case, the, the memory trace that you're trying to bring back has got some kind of information about the spatial context, the, the location in which it took place. So when you represent a picture of the location, that resembles somehow the information stored and helps you retrieve the memory. So this is Q overlap. Um, can we show that this actually determines the degree to which we can recollect selectively? Um, it hasn't really been shown yet um, in the way that we want. I'll say why in a second. Um, the alternative theory is just you can sec selectively recollect when it's easy to re recollect the thing that you're, you're after, which is a sort of boring account, but a reasonable one. Um, so the question um, that's uh, slightly more difficult, so you can use behavioural studies just to show what triggers recollection and what doesn't in terms of external context and, and external instructions to recreate an internal context. So you can do that, but it's hard to tell whether selection really occurs before recollection. So is it truly selective memory or are we just kind of remembering lots of stuff and sorting through it afterwards? So we want to try and understand and study pre-retrieval control that allows us to select what we remember before we've remembered a bunch of different events. So the experimental paradigm that we've used here to um, 
access this is called the exclusion task. It was invented by Larry Jacoby in the early 90s for a slightly different reason. It's been used quite a lot in ERP studies that are trying to look at this problem. So we're not the first, um, but what we're doing new here is looking at the external queue overlap in a systematic way and then some of the other stuff that I'll tell you about later. So in a study phase, people see a series of objects and they're presented in one of two formats. So they're presented either as pictures or they're presented as auditory words. So the auditory word presentation is you just hear someone saying rabbit belt or you see a banana, you see a car. Um, then in the test phase, there are two different blocks. So there's um, a target audio block and that's where your goal is to remember the uh, items that were studied as auditory words and exclude, i.e. say no to everything else. Everything else here being items studied as pictures, items that you've not studied before. So you say yes to items from one source for people that are used to that language and no to items from this other source or new items. And then it flips around in the um, target picture condition where people are asked to um, target items that were studied as pictures. So remember those and then reject everything that was um, studied as audio or new. So I I can't see the chat, but you can see the chat if people are kind of sticking. If, you, if anyone wants me to explain something a bit more about the methods, I can stop any time. So what we did was we, we measured EEG, 64 channels, um, um, and yeah. Yeah. Previous, can you hear me right? Sort of, yes. Try have a go. So on the previous slide, um, yeah. how are you presenting the, the targets? Is it as, as text on the screen? Oh yeah, sorry. So at the moment, um, I forgot to say that. Thank you. So at the moment, the queue, uh, the the cues are visual words. So this is the first experiment. The cues that everyone's seeing are visual words. So they're more similar to the target audio condition than they are to the target picture condition. This is the um, what will be a manipulation of cue overlap across two experiments. So in the target audio condition, we've got a higher overlap with the target audio words and a lower overlap with the non-target and vice versa in the target picture condition. And it's, and it's higher overlap because you naturally hear a word and it, like it's closer to see a word than hear it? Well, it's done on um, a kind of intuitive subdivision of the processes we think are involved in processing words versus processing pictures. Um, but I think the proof of the pudding is going to be in the results. I mean, of course, it'd be nice to be able to to measure overlap. And indeed, that's what we start trying to do when I talk about the multivariate data. So um, let's 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 get to that. And then you can tell me if you think it's convincing. Thanks for being my memory cue. Um, so experiment one, so what we're looking at here is ERPs, and so we're looking at the neural activity elicited in response to these retrieval cues, these visual words, and we're focusing on this effect called the left parietal old new effect, which is a well-established uh, neural correlate of recollection, um, and as I say on a later slide, it's been linked to the amount of rec information that's recollected um, and the precision of information that's recollected and it's been linked to recollection as opposed to familiarity or weak memory so this is the effect we're using we use an a priori time window um, here for five to eight hundred milliseconds post stimulus and we used um, a priori parietal electrodes on the left and so what we find is that when people are targeting items they studied as words then we only see a left parietal effect to targets we don't see a significant one to non-targets and we see a substantial difference between those two conditions. So this is our index that we're choosing to use of um, the, the degree to which recollection is selective for targets. Um, so looking at the target picture condition in contrast, we see um, no significant difference between the um, two conditions, target and non-target. Um, and this is as predicted according to the Q overlap um, account and importantly it goes against the difficulty account because performance was better for items that were studied as pictures in both um, conditions so in both cases 
accuracy was better for items studied with pictures and reaction times were slightly faster. And so this um, is in keeping with the other well-known effect of picture superiority, but it suggests that um, simple target retrieval difficulty can't account for that result. So there's a significant interaction between trial type and block as well. So we wanted to nail this. And so what we did to nail it um, was, uh, well, Ariana did it um, really, um, was to run the same experiment, but change the cues. So we created these sort of simplified line drawing style images from the pictures, and we used them as the retrieval cues instead of visual words. And so we hypothesized the overlap was now higher with the target pictures, greater similarity between target pictures and, um, the, and the retrieval cues. And so we should see the opposite pattern of ERP selectivity according to conditions. So um, that's indeed what we did find. So here's the target picture condition now, which shows a selective pattern. So it's not completely selective, but the target um, left parietal ERP is substantially larger than the non-target one, although there's a small but significant difference from, between non-targets and new items. Um, and in the target audio condition, it's completely flipped. In fact, the non-target ERP is non-significantly larger, but numerically larger than the target ERP there um, at these electrodes. So this um, therefore supports I think both our assumptions and our predictions, although maybe someone will come up with another explanation for it, but um, suggesting that the, the overlap or similarity between the queue and the targeted information is a really important factor. Sorry, yes, the performance remained better for pictures than were targets, although slightly um, less surprising here where the, the encoding retrieval match and the um, what was studied at um, study were now sort of congruent, but um, that was as expected, and again, an interaction. So in summary, these data suggest that external memory cues are critical for selective recollection, um, and that this cue overlap somehow overrides the ease or otherwise of the target or non-target recollection as shown by experiment one in particular. Um, and the, I'll show you a kind of model at the end with some speculation, hand wavy speculations, but um, based on intracranial recordings and other, uh, in particular, what we know about when recollection happens and when things happen in the hippocampus, um, this is around the time that recollection happens. And so the fact that we modify stuff that's going on from 500 milliseconds over the next few milliseconds suggests that this is happening prior to recollection. Anything that was much beyond that time window wouldn't really be convincing for that. So we can ask further questions, lots of further questions. So. I started by talking about internal queuing, etc., but I haven't actually shown anything yet to do with internal queuing. So how do we know this is going on? Is it going on? And how is it contributing to performance on this task and to these selective effects? Well, um, obviously people are managing to do the task. So the internal girls are achieving something, they're identifying the right thing as the target, but is it affecting what they retrieve and, and how they do it? Um, so looking at, um, so yeah, we can measure another ERP effect here to look at um, the presence of information about goals. And what we do here is measure what's called a retrieval orientation effect. It's just a goal um, related ERP and it's measured here. We did an exploratory analysis, but it was based a bit on a previous study, a grid of electrodes over the, the sort of center of the scalp. And um, here, as you can see, when we were looking at um, ERPs elicited by items that were never studied. So these new items, any differences in the way that their process has to be the way that people are using them as retrieval cues, not what's actually retrieved. And indeed, we found differences over quite a long time period um, here, as has been found in previous studies by ourselves and others. Um, and the more positive going condition was the target audio condition, which is the higher overlap condition here in green. Um, and then in experiment two, um, again, as predicted by the assumption that goal related processing somehow tracks overlap, the degree to which it's um, engaged tracks overlap. We now see a flip of the sign here. It's a slightly smaller effect, but it's still significant. It's over the um, the similar scalp area um, and it's more positive going for the target picture condition, which is where you've got the, the high um, Q overlap. So um, 
these ERPs to, I realise I'm now showing you the Zoom faces, which is not necessary, the ERPs to the unstudied um, new items, which couldn't be remembered, are tracking retrieval goals, and those ERPs are themselves tracking Q overlap. Um, yes, negative going low overlap, uh, positive going high overlap. So it's suggesting that the relationship between the Q that you're given and what you're searching for as targets is um, something that determines the way that you process um, retrieval cues in line with your goals. So that's nice, but it's still not getting downstream to the um, selectivity effect that we've looked at already. And it's not really telling us what's happening um, in terms of how these, um, what this goal related processing might be and how it's um, used. So one thing we did, which was rather a nice um, reviewer too, so this is under revision at CABN at the moment, um, just been resubmitted. So reviewer two pointed out that we actually had an N of 58 um, over two experiments. And so we could look at the correlation between this goal related ERP, which we think of here as the internal queuing ERP and the degree to which the um, left parietal ERP, the recollection one is selective for targets over non targets. And we did it separately in the target audio and target picture condition. These are the same participants two different conditions. So it's the same retrieval orientation ERP, but correlated with different parietal ERP selectivity. And we flip the sign so that we're always looking at the degree to which people's um, goal related retrieval orientation ERP favors in terms of positivity, the targeted source. So their ERP to the targeted source positively and fairly substantially correlates with the degree to which selective recollection is achieved. Now, um, we, what we don't see, and these are the R's, um, what we don't see is a significant difference between experiments. Um, so it's interesting, actually, that I think that what this means, we haven't made a lot of it in the paper, but I think what, what this seems to mean, at least in this case, is that perhaps the effect of internal and external queuing are kind of independent of each other. So on average, people are orienting in terms of the, where the positivity goes to the um, high overlap source. And, um, on, and individually, the more they do that, um, the, the better they do in terms of selectivity. But it doesn't differ according to um, which, whether it's a high overlap source or not. So in target audio, in the experiment one, um, the target audio is a high overlap source. And in experiment two, it's the low overlap source. This is a rather hard to get your head around flip. But basically, what, we're set, what I'm saying is that this relationship doesn't depend on Q overlap. So we get an average effect of Q overlap um, across experiment, uh, between experiments, and then sticking the experiments together, we get an effect of individual differences, which is nice because it shows the relationship between these two ERPs. We don't get a relationship with individual differences in the performance. This will be an interesting one to, to cover in the discussion, although other people, including us, have found relationships between individual difference measures of ability and selectivity. So it's not it's, it's not that it's not been shown to have behavioral relevance, it has, but um, there's a lot more to do on that front. So moving on now, so any questions about what, what we've done there, what I've tried to explain there so far? So if there aren't, then what I'm gonna do is just to um, move on and start talking about how internal queuing might work, getting back again to this idea of um, Q overlap and encoding specificity, um, but talking about the internal processes and whether they use the same mechanism as has been proposed um, by the people back in the 70s and since who talk about mental reinstatement of context. So, um, yeah, this is this idea that uh, what we do when we're trying to internally trigger memory retrieval is to try and do exactly what the external queue would do. So instead of going to campus or looking at a photograph of campus to remember things that happened there, we we'll try and imagine it just like the participants in Smith studies in the 70s. Um, and in fact, this is actually used in the well known cognitive interview that's used in eyewitness um, um, questioning. So it's something mental reinstatement is actually a quite good practical in sort of de demonstrable practical reinforcement, although it's terribly abstract. And of course, we've not observed it in such a direct way, really. Um, but what we can do with um, EEG um, and, and with fMRI is we can actually look at the similarity between brain patterns and that allows us to test uh, 
this theory in a way that hasn't been possible until now. So we um, we, we we say that this this idea of mental reinstatement predicts that when people are processing their goals, they will reinstate the same brain patterns that were present at the time of the original events they're trying to bring back to mind. So if I was trying to imagine a scene, then some of my neural patterns will be similar to the patterns that I saw when I was actually experiencing that scene. And there's lots of memory effects like that, but not in relation to goals. So we, uh, we use multivariate decoding to try and get a handle on this. Um, we use a linear discriminant classifier for those that are interested um, to distinguish the study audio from the study picture condition at study. So distinguish the audios from the pictures, which is quite easy. Then we use that classifier to detect re reinstatement of the same patterns um, by classifying the test phase data. Uh, memory people will know this kind of technique. Um, it's looking at when, when I say a pattern, I mean a scalp pattern of um, active activity over electrodes. There's more than one way of doing this with EEG, but that's the method we used. So um, here, I haven't made it very mysterious by covering up the, the second plot, but uh, let's just look at the left-hand one first, the unstudied retrieval cues. And what you've got here is you've got um, the classifier fidelity um, for um, retrieval cues. These are the same new items that we were looking at the ERPs to um, the, the average ERPs at these electrodes to before. And the classifier fidelity is plotted against both encoding time bin and retrieval time bin. So this is a, a window from 200 to 800 milliseconds because we wanted to see if anything might be happening sort of early, um, although it's not. Um, and most of what's happening is after the 500 milliseconds. But remember that this is not when people are recollecting. This is just when people are processing goals. Um, so we've trained the classifier on the encoding phase and um, Class, and when it's trained on the encoding phase in the early part here, the early part of the encoding trial, sort of around 200 milliseconds, then that classifier will also classify whether people are searching for target pictures or searching for target words. So this is saying that the brain patterns at retrieval between about five and 800 milliseconds are similar to the brain patterns that people had when they were initially processing the presented items. So this is what happens for the new items. We also looked at these preparatory cues. So we just had some fixation signs uh, a couple of seconds before each retrieval cue. So before the word that people were trying to um, remember if it was a picture or a word. Um, and these um, reminded them of the goal. So these preparatory cues were just a little reminder of the goal that they were currently using in that block. And um, we found um, Reinstatement in this case, it was very much of patterns from later in the encoding time window. Um, I'll say more about this uh, on a later slide. And we found again that there was a, a quite a substantial similarity between the patterns at retrieval during this preparatory pe period when they were about to be asked to remember a specific item as if they were kind of refreshing their goals, perhaps. But um, yeah, so this was quite a nice result. What we didn't have, unfortunately, was enough trials to look at whether this reinstatement here predicts whether people get it right or not. This is what I would love to do, but yeah, sadly, we've only got enough trials. I'm at nine people, so I'm not going to insult statistics by um, doing that. Um, I said thank you at the bottom of this slide. I'm not done quite this early, but um, ELPs. So we found that ELPs reflecting current goals track the... Yes. Yes. Oh, sorry. 0 0.5. It's sorry. It's a it's a 0 0.05 alpha level plus the corrected test. So. I think it's like 0 0.5 percent people's chance of each one of Oh no, it's not. Um, it's it it's um it's not as simple as that. It's the fidelity of the classifier. So I don't actually know. Oh no, actually, I think. You know, you're right, Jamie, I've given the accuracy plots, the fidelity plots look even prettier um, and have uh, lower p values. But yes, on that line, it is indeed, um, it is indeed 0.5 as charged. But it's, yeah, thanks. 
Plus it's not a huge amount above chance, is no. it? But it looks very pretty. So. Yes. Yeah. Well, it is, you know. It's and a huge yeah. amount of permutations, as you say. So to get anything out is uh, pretty cool, I guess. I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. But yes, it's. Uh, I, I agree. It's not like showing their entire brain as being dedicated only to this activity right now. But that's probably a good thing. Also, Chris, Chris is asking, um, uh, and is this a contrast? If so, what do you think? It's been contrasted. So it's been contrasted that uh, what they're what they're searching for as targets. So they're um, trained on picture and audio at study, and then at test they're searching for picture targets versus audio targets. So it's decoding the goal that they've currently got. Is that all right? Is that all right? Make sense? He said nothing, so it must make sense. Um, so yeah, so we're finding that ELPs reflecting the current goals do also track the degree of Q overlap with the studied um, events, um, which is pretty direct evidence for encoding specificity. It's not the only such evidence. There's been evidence from free recall studies, but the disadvantage of free recall is that when this activity is measured, it's done sort of in the second or so before people start recalling items. And of course, it's quite difficult to tell really if this is really pre-retrieval um, um, goal really sort of search related activity or whether it's um, actual retrieval for those who are interested in the details. So, so we see these effects so far. Internal queuing um, is um, showing um, average ERP effects and reinstatement effects um, that seem to be largely at least independent of the external queue effects that both feed into the degree to which recollection appears to be selective using our measure that left parietal ERP. We don't know from our data because the effects go in both directions whether people are using internal queuing more when overlap is high, external overlap, or when it's low. I don't feel we can speak to that yet. Um, and it looks like internal queue may act via mental reinstatement as predicted by encoding specificity back in the 70s. Um, and um, that maybe we're possibly seeing two distinct mental reinstatement processes because the the part of the encoding time window, the type of process um, is different for the two effects that I showed you. So I'll, this will become relevant again in a minute. So early activity at encoding is reinstated by unstudied cues, and then later activity is reinstated by the preparatory cues. I'll show you the rest of the results so you can decide if that's a relevant distinction. Um, so sorry, I'm rushing too far ahead. So yes, that's as predicted. So um, the last thing I want to show you is, um, I should talk more slowly, um, is um, some data on that, that may be questioning some of the assumptions that at least some of us have about how and when selection operates and what's going on and we think are kind of interesting in pointing to a possible refinement of current views on what happens during recollection. So this is the ambitious interpretation, I'll show you the data. Um, so. As I mentioned earlier, the left parietal ERP has for a long time been associated with comparisons between recollection and familiarity and strong and weak memory, if you don't believe in those two being separate processes. And it's associated with amount of recollection and precision. And so it's really generally seen as an index of the degree of recollection success. Um, but there are other ways we can measure recollection, right? And this is something that's done a lot in fMRI and actually is sometimes used as a measure of recollection. And so what we are going to look at now is the degree to which people also reinstate encoding patterns, but they do it when they retrieve the episode. So this is very well established, um, both in terms of fMRI and indeed in terms of intracranial recordings from the hippocampus, as well as from cortical regions that neural patterns that were around when we experienced things get reinstated when we remember things. And in the early, um, 2000s, it was proposed that this was the basis of the experience of recollection. So not just somehow the neural building blocks by which we remember bits of information like visual bits, audio bits, semantic bits, different bits of information about the past and how we put them together. But the idea was that this neural reinstatement predominantly in cortex is really the basis of this reliving the past that people like to talk about when they talk about episodic memory. You might not quite feel that Proustian reliving the past vibe every time you remember an event, but certainly many people experience it at some point. So we've 
tended to we've observed this many times using fMRI and we've tended to think okay this is this is what it means not everyone thinks that um and I'll come to that in a sec so um what we're going to do is to now look at what happens when people actually remember the items so remembering the targets and the non-targets themselves um and we're going to measure what happens when they remember them the degree to which those neural patterns remember uh, uh, reinstate the um, encoding phase study pattern from the original events and we're going to do it with mvpa again and um yeah it's something that's been done in fmri but not so much in um eeg and it hasn't really been applied to my knowledge yet to um selectivity uh, of um goal relevant or preferred versus non-preferred information so this is uh, the idea of this amount and qu quality of reinstatement that we're going to look at is that it's something to do with the amount and quality of memory that can tell us a bit more about what's being recollected and how. So um, what we did was we used the same linear discriminant classifier that we trained it on the study phase to discriminate between pictures and auditory words. And then we applied it to the test phase in a number of different ways. Well, two different ways, I'm gonna show you one. We, we took each condition separately so we looked at targets versus new in the audio block and targets versus new in the picture block. So that meant basically a test pretending. So in the audio block, we treated the targets as the audio condition and, and the new items as the picture condition with the classifier. Did the same for non-targets. So with non-targets in the audio block, these were items, of course, that were studied as pictures. So we treated them as the picture condition and the new items as the audio condition again just for those that are interested in the details of how we did it. Um, and so what you can see here, so this is the tar target audio block and we've got the same encoding phase time windows and retrieval phase also the same time windows as for the new items. So it's, it wasn't actually significant. So this is the classifier fidelity. I've given you the right plots this time. It wasn't actually significant in the, for the targets in the target audio block, but that, isn't, that doesn't really matter too much, I don't think for the main message here. Because what we were kind of expecting, just to remind you, if recollection is selective, and this is shown in reinstatement as well as in the parietal effect, then we should see reinstatement for um, uh, targets and not non-targets, right? So in fact, what we see here is um, some, a hint of reinstatement, which is not significant for targets, and uh, a big blob, a big cluster here for non-targets in the target audio block. So this is different from the ELP data. So non-target reinstatement, but not targets. And um, this is again within the same, what I'm thinking of as the recollection time window, 500 to 800 milliseconds post stimulus. And then in the target pictures block, the um, picture reinstatement of, um, is significant for targets. That's fine, not so important, um, but again, it's significant for non-targets. So a cluster here again in the same retrieval time window, um, so this is um, just to recap showing there's some reinstatement for targets, but only in the picture condition, but critically in both conditions, we're seeing reinstatement of information about of neural patterns and suggesting information is being um, reinstated about non-targets. And also critically, when we compare non-targets and targets directly, there's no significant clusters. So this looks like a different pattern. Obviously these are um, null effects for targets versus non-targets and these cluster tests and if anyone here knows how to do a base factor on a cluster test please can they tell me because i'd love to be able to do that but we've got another analysis that i think sheds a bit of light on it um and this other analysis is picking up again on this suggestion that um, we may be able to analyze the kind of information that's being retrieved by um, dividing it up according to which encoding time window it comes from so here you can see early um, encoding information is being reinstated and with an eye of faith, maybe here, but not significant in this contrast. Whereas um, here you're seeing maybe later information is being reinstated um, and maybe here too, um, in, as, uh, as you might be able to deduce if you've been following this carefully, but I'll remind you um, here, the items were studied as audio words and their targets in the audio block. And here they were also studied as audio words, their targets, uh, non targets in the picture block. And these were studied as pictures, these two. So um, 
we wanted to do this. It wasn't just data driven. We wanted to do it also because other people, Maria Wimmer's lab from Glasgow, they found some interesting results in terms of when different kinds of information are reinstated and the order in which they're reinstated. So we'd actually gone in with some a priori time windows from early in encoding um, based on their study and then just divided up the later phase and encoding into two other time windows. So there were four time windows, but the early ones behave roughly the same and the late ones behave roughly the same. And so we wanted to look at what information is reinstated. Does it differ? Um, so does it come from a different time window if it's auditory versus picture, as maybe it should? And does this separate the targets from the non-targets in some way that we haven't achieved so far? Or does it look the same? And here, um, slightly complicated picture, but I'll just explain it. So here on the x-axis, we've got which encoding window it came from. So early and early. So these are the early ones and these two are the late ones. So you can see in the early time window, people are tending to reinstate information about, um, sorry, at retrieval, people are tending to reinstate information about the early encoding time window when they are remembering something that was studied as audio. And when they're remembering something that's studied as a picture, then they reinstate information that came from later in the encoding time window. Now, this in itself isn't news because it's it's sort of analogous to a number of findings that you get in um, fMRI, but it will allow, allow us to explore things a bit further and critically. We can also look at um, um, yes, targets and non-targets, which is covered up by the Zoom menu, but that's targets and that's non-targets. And um, there was no significant difference between these two. Um, and um, they, they show roughly the same um, pattern. So um, what we found was sort of convincing me more that there's really no difference between targets and non-targets and extending results of fMRI reinstatement analyses that have shown that you get these sort of qualitatively different information patterns retrieved depending on the information that was originally studied. So yeah, and this didn't happen. None of this happened pre-retrieval, but following the retrieval queue, which we'd kind of been hoping. So that was something we didn't get, but we did get all of this interesting reinstatement in the recollection time window. So what does this tell us about selection then? So that's the kind of question. And that's what I think is particularly what well, was to me, a little bit surprising about the data until somebody reminded me of an old paper by Maurice Moscovich when I presented this at MDRS. Um, and um, so we see that the left parietal ERP shows this pre retrieval selection pattern where um, it depends on internal cues and uh, external cues, and targets get favored in terms of the degree of the left, the magnitude of the left parietal effect. Um, but then when we look at the reinstatement of the, the scalp ERP patterns, we don't see a target selective pattern. So what I'm going to suggest is happening maybe, but obviously it needs a bit of fMRI to test it properly and maybe some source analysis, um, is that um, if we make a couple of assumptions, we can make some proposals about what we're going to see in terms of the regions involved and, and when things happen. So we're going to assume that the scalp patterns that we're seeing reflect a kind of widespread pattern of cortical reinstatement across lots of regions, which probably most people think is reasonable. Um, and also that the left parietal ERP reflects activity in the posterior parietal cortex, particularly the angular gyrus, the lateral um, posterior inferior region. Not enough people have actually amazing how many years people have been doing ERP and fMRI to study memory and how few studies have really put them together. Um, and um, we don't really know with confidence that this is the source that a lot of people think it might be because of similar variables affecting both of them. Um, so this is what I'm going to propose based on this kind of um, these, these assumptions. So here's just a picture that I've kind of stolen and adapted from this um, nice review by Bernard Starazina and Maria Wimber, which is kind of um, reviewing what we know about when things happen in terms of recollection based on intracranial stuff that they've done as well as um, e.g. and the regions uh, that they've localized it to. So here's the hippocampus, here's the external cue, the word zebra, um, and here's a representational of an internal goal. So they're all feeding into um, what triggers recollection, and we've talked about that a lot already. And what, what we're interested in particularly now is what happens at the point of recollection and soon after. So according to um, gen very generally accepted models, the hippocampus carries out this process called pattern completion, 
get the partial cue, whether this is internal or external representation, and then reinstate the patterns in cortex to reflect to some degree partially the representation of seeing a zebra. Um, but not just in the sort of sensory regions um, that, that might show you this picture, but also, um, and this is, I'm just trying to refer to it with the letter R, and, but also in the parietal regions, the posterior parietal regions, which are um, known to interact with the hippocampus and sensory cortices. And we don't really know much about the direction of these interactions, but we do know that the parietal cortex holds um, integrated representations of multiple dimensions of events at the same time. Um, and so maybe the selection is kind of happening somewhere here in between, not in the, the uh, not at the point of cortical reinstatement itself, but at the point where the cortical representations are integrated into the representations in posterior parietal cortex. Um, so that's my, my conclusion. There's obviously more questions than answers as usual. Um, so in conclusion, um, we're reasonably confident about the um, results for the external and internal cues, what they mean, although um, there's outstanding questions there too. Um, but yes, we speculate that the pre-retrieval control may act at this later stage of processing rather than initial cortical reinstatement that it acts on the posterior parietal representations or just before them. Um, and it's co consistent with data that have actually in more recent years shown that neural reinstatement um, even in sensory regions has a more complex uh, relation to reinstate the recollection than originally thought. So Mick Rugg and, and um, colleagues in particular have found that when you have uh, failures of recollection for remembered items, you also do sometimes get reinstatement in uh, a couple of different memory tasks, which has made this open to question. Um, so it's also consistent with um, other data from neuropsychology, um, for example, and TMS um, work by John Simon's lab in particular that suggests the posterior parietal cortex has got a particular role in supporting the subjective experience of recollection. And so maybe um, we, we select what we subjectively recollect, but we don't necessarily select what we remember. So lots of open questions. Um, so in terms of this internal queuing, it'd be really nice to actually look at the networks that are representing the goals and, and, and where the mental reinstatement is happening. Um, so it might be that, yeah, I've already said that I'd really like to see if this mental reinstatement predicts successful retrieval, as it's quite a strong prediction that it should. Um, and whether we get some kind of differences in the regions that are involved in representing the goals. So for example, what's the current target? Um, which is slightly less exciting because you know people are representing that because they're doing the task, but um, maybe um, this is separate from the regions and networks that are representing the context. We can also try and understand the stages of retrieval at which, um, oh, oh yeah, sorry, also um, there's a nice um, paper we're going to talk about in our memory journal club, but if anyone's interested in what's been done in free recall, there's a nice paper from Mike Kahana's lab just out looking at um, context and content representations and how they may function differently. But from our point of view, yes, I'm interested in this um, finding that suggests that perhaps the automatic, um, the cortical reinstatement is automatic. And it turns out, yeah, Morris Moscovich had um, something to say about this in 2008. There's not loads of evidence for it, but it's something that would be cool to explore further um, and explore further the link between um, the um, subjective recollection in, of, of, of particularly in relation to selection and uh, <coughs> the posterior parietal representations in uh, angular gyrus and elsewhere. Uh, and then the other thing, of course, that I'm really interested in um, is aging, because one of the reasons that I kind of came to investigating this in the first place is there's evidence that at least sometimes older people don't engage these sort of internal proactive control mechanisms, particularly maybe prior to retrieval, and this may um, contribute to their memory problems. Um, and also that younger people differ in this ability. And for example, working memory capacity has been linked to um, the selectivity of the left parietal ELP effect in several different studies now, including one of ours. And so uh, anyway, watch this space. We'll see if I can manage to get some funding for some of this follow-up work. Thank you for listening. That's it from me for now, so questions. <coughs> One, two questions. 
Sam, uh, yes. Thank you for a really interesting talk. I had, I had a question with regards to the first ERP coding capacity that we did. Yeah. Um, so in that, with the, the, um, those, the coding accuracy maps that you showed, yeah. um, it looked like um, for the unstudied retrieval queues, yeah. um, there's like, there's uh, after, uh, late, if you train the classifier with late encoding time points, it looks it looks almost like it's it's negatively <laughs> predicting the wrong class later on. I yeah. wonder if that's that's like an adaptation effect or something, such that you know if you're kind of you're maintaining information about the 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 queue during encoding period too long or something like that, it predicts the wrong class or I don't know. Have you got any firstly is yeah. that real like it looks like it would be significant. I well this is the, it's controversial whether you think it's real. So what I did so Sam's asking is there anything going on in this sort of possible negative puddle here of um below chance um classification? The answer is well I'm, we made a motivated decision not to look and did one tail tests on the basis that um, I didn't have any hypothesis about it. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I have looked at it and thought maybe there's something. It's the sort of thing that I'd, I'd, I'd have to have a little bit more of a theory about whether yeah. there's some, I mean, why would someone reinstate the thing that they're not seeking for? I suppose the only reason, so the one thing we haven't done yet is we haven't looked at individual differences in this reinstatement yet and so one of the things if you look back at that there's one thing about this task i don't like that we're changing in the follow-up studies is that there's only one non-target category and so it's reasonable for some people to think well i'm not going to bother trying to retrieve the targets especially if they're a bit more difficult i'm going to use what's called a recall to reject strategy and it's likely that some people do do that even though on average people don't um, because if you look at these individual differences here, we do get sort of negative selectivity effects. They're not significant in the half of in the portion of people that show them, um, even when you select for your statistical test like that. But yeah, I mean, there's a suggestion, and so there's a worry about the the range of strategies open to people in this only two source task. And we're trying, we're we're, we're now developing versions where you've got multiple sources to try and. And so hopefully that will go away and that will be probably what it's due to. Good question. Uh, Chris, quick little question. Chris has a question, yeah. Oh yeah. I was wondering what you think with the reinstatement analyses is being reinstated or what, what you're picking up on. I mean, do you think it's actually the, the item level stuff or it's just more of a sort of mode of thinking that your brain goes into? in some trials uh yes is a that's also a very good question i mean so in the recollection analysis we could look we haven't yet to see if there's if there's greater reinstatement when the item is the same as when you're just targeting that information which has been shown with fmri um but it's a fairly small effect so we intend to look at that so you can look at that um probably a certain amount of it is more generic um, but yeah, we don't know what really happens. So are people just kind of somehow attentionally tuning up their, their audio, audio, audio representations or their visual representations? It's not clear. And it's not clear even the degree to which they're elaborating on the cues by tuning up some representations or adding processing versus kind of restricting processing of other kinds. Cool, thanks. Cool, thanks for the question. Ed? Follow up question. Um, so, to get that question about what is reinstated, if you look at the weights of the classifier, what we do in topography and the weights to see whether it looks arbitrary, it might be if your hypothesis is that it's arbitrary stuff that's been reinstated. It's true, yes, we could do an importance map. I mean, we have to always. Be a little bit kind of scare quotey about importance maps, but we could we can have a little look at some point. We will do that. Um, of course, then we could we could try and um, do a classification based on a subset of electrodes. I guess I'm a little bit unconvinced we'd get anything, and it would be a bit too much fishing. But certainly with fMRI, we'll be able to look at that much better. Yeah, oh. Going back to your model, would explain. Uh, in the same way, uh, with the selection of 
I can clean things and valuable things, so because things are more complex, we would have less selectivity in the final and I can more spread the fact that I put something wrong in the beginning, I send it to the very beginning. So Flavia is asking if you might get less selectivity for some kind of information than others, and she's talking about scenes, complex scenes with objects. Yeah, I mean, certainly I'd expect the degree of selectivity. What I would expect it to track, if you're really sticking to encoding specificity, is the degree to which the, the non-targeted information also overlaps with the studied episodes and the queue. And so if you've got um, yeah, so if your targets and non targets are very similar, it might be difficult to be selective. Um, that's partial answer only, I think. You may be asking something more subtle about semantic representations. I'd also like the other thing that would be nice to do um, would be to do some uh, model based decoding where you can actually, uh, that's a better answer to Ed's question, which I've already failed to get funding for, but use models of um, semantic similarity and Phonological similarity and, and use those to try and work out what's being reinstated. I think we may have to leave the room, but so, yes. thanks for all the great questions, everyone, and thanks for coming. Yes, indeed. Thank you very much for that. Sir. Um, the session will be in this room again next week, and it will be uh, James Webb from EdgeLab. So. EdgeLab next week. Yeah.